Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture 27 of Introductory Linear Algebra. In today's class we're going to look at two new subspaces that are going to come up over and over and over again throughout the rest of this course. And these subspaces, they come from looking at matrices. Okay, so what are they? What are these two new subspaces that we're going to look at? Well, they're called the range and null space of a matrix. Okay, so the setup is you've got some particular matrix A that you're looking at. Okay, and well then the range of that matrix, it's the set of all vectors that are possible outputs upon matrix multiplication with that matrix, okay? So in other words, if you're interested in the matrix A, then the range of that matrix, it's the collection of all vectors of the form A times X, where X can be anything, okay? It's any possible input vector. Okay, so the way to think of this is you're thinking of your matrix A as a linear transformation that's sending X to AX. Okay, then the range of that matrix, it's the set of all output vectors, right? It's the set of all things that X can possibly be mapped to. That's what the range of the matrix is. Okay, and then the other new subspace that we're gonna be looking at, it's called the null space. And what it is, is it's just everything that is sent to zero. So again, if you're thinking of A as a linear transformation that's sending vectors to vectors, then the null space of that matrix or that linear transformation, it's the set of all input vectors X that get mapped down to zero. It's the set of all vectors that just get squished away sort of to nothing, just get squished right down to the origin. So in other words, it's the set of solutions to the linear system, AX equals zero. All right, and now certainly it's clear that both of these sets are sets, right? Like they're collections of vectors, but it's not obvious at first glance that they are subspaces, right? Remember to be a subspace, the set has to have these two extra properties. It has to be closed under vector addition and it has to be closed under scalar multiplication. So let's show that these two sets actually have those two properties. So let's show that they really are subspaces now. All right, so let's start off with a null space of a matrix. Why is that a subspace? Well, again, you've got to check those two defining properties. Properties, we called them A and B in the previous video. So property A was if you have two things in the set, then their sum had better be in the set as well. So if V and W are in the set, then V plus W had better also be in the set. Okay, so our goal here is to show that, hey, if V and W are in the null space, then V plus W is also in the null space. That's what we're trying to show. All right, well, what? just use the definition of everything. If V and W are in the null space, what that means is that A times V equals zero and A times W equals zero. That's just the definition of the null space. Okay, and I wanna show that V plus W is in the null space. In other words, I wanna show that A times V plus W equals zero. So, I mean, all you have to do is you just add up these two equations over here. If you add them up, then what you get is, well, A times V plus W is AV plus AW, and well, that's just the sum of a couple of zeros. That's zero plus zero, which is zero as well. Okay, so the point is A times V plus W equals zero, in other words, V plus W is in the null space. Okay, that's what we just showed. We showed V plus W gets mapped to zero as well, so it's in the null space. So property A is satisfied. Okay, if you add up two things in the null space, yeah, you get something in the null space. And now we've got to show the same thing for scalar multiplication. If you start off with something in the null space, show that if I multiply it by any scalar, then it's still in the null space. So the way I do that is, again, just via all the definitions, okay? V is in the null space. What that means is AV equals zero. Okay, my goal is to show that CV is in the null space, so I wanna show that A times CV also equals zero. Okay, and this just follows immediately from what we know about scalar multiplication, right? A times CV, well, I can just pull the C out in front, okay? Scalars commute with multiplication. Okay, so then that's just C times AV, but AV is zero, so this is C times zero, which is just still the zero vector. Okay, so A times CV equals the zero vector. So in other words, CV is in the null space. All right, so yeah, it's closed under vector addition. It's closed under scalar multiplication. So our conclusion is that yes, this set, this null space, it really is a subspace of the input space. Okay, so maybe just a little note on the dimensions here. We said that the matrix was M by N. So that means the N input space is N dimensional. The output space is M dimensional. Okay, and the null space, it's a, it's a collection of input vectors. So it's a subspace of Rn. It's the set of all input vectors that get mapped to zero. All right, let's do the same thing for the range now. Okay, in the range, it's a subspace of the output space, right? It's the set of all things that get mapped to by the matrix. Okay, it's the set of all possible outputs of that matrix. Okay, so, sorry about the jump there. 
again, we've got to check those two properties. We've got to check that, hey, if I have two things in the set, then their sum is still in the set. Okay, so again, let's just use the definition. It takes a little bit more thinking this time, okay? The range is a little bit harder to get our head around than the, the null space is. But if you've got two vectors in the range, then what that means is there are vectors that map to those two vectors. In other words, there are vectors x and y that get sent to v and w, okay? In other words, there are vectors x and y such that ax equals v and ay equals w, right? There are sort of inputs corresponding to these outputs. That's what we're saying here. And now I wanna show that v plus w is also in the range. Okay, so the way I do that is I've got to find some input that gets sent to the output v plus w. All right, so how do I do that? Well, just note that, hey, v plus w, what did I just say? v is ax and w is ay, so just make those substitutions. v plus w is ax plus ay. And now factor. I've got an a on the left and both of those just factor it out on the left. I get a times x plus y. And now I've actually got exactly what I wanted, right? I've got, hey, the output I wanted, v plus w, and I found an input, x plus y, that gets mapped there, that gets sent there by a. a times this input equals the output I wanted. Okay, so in particular, v plus w, yeah, it's in the range of a because a times something equals v plus w. Great, so that's property A. Property B is similar, just with scalar multiplication instead of vector addition. If you got something in the range, then what that means is there exists an input X such that the output V equals AX. Okay, there's some input that gets mapped to our output. Okay, now I wanna show that CV is also in the range. In other words, I wanna show that there's something that's mapped to CV. There's some way to get CV as the output, okay? And the way to do this is just note that, hey, CV equals C times AX. And then we can just absorb the C on the inside here. This is the same as A times CX. Okay, so yeah, A times something equals CV. So CV must be in the range. So CV is in the range. So yeah, because properties A and B are both satisfied, range is also a subspace. That's what we just showed there. Okay, so yeah, range and null space, they're both subspaces because they satisfy those two properties. And maybe just before we do an example on actually computing the range in null space, um, just a brief note on the range of a matrix. We're using the terminology range here in the exact same sense that you've seen the terminology range used for functions in general in previous courses. Okay, so in previous courses, you've seen functions of one variable, right? Functions that have an input as a real number and a, an output as also a real number. So, you know, takes in a real number, spits out a real number. And you said that the range of a function back then was, you know, it's just a set of all possible outputs. It's the set of, of f of x's where x is just an arbitrary real number. You know, you plug anything in, collect together all of the outputs. That's what the range of a function was. For a matrix, it's the exact same thing, just with different input and output spaces. Okay, the range of a matrix A, well, it's the set of all outputs A times X, where X can be anything. So here, like the vector X is your input and AX is your output, okay? So the matrix, like we're thinking of it as a function that transforms vectors into other vectors. And it's range, is just the usual notion of range that you're used to, okay? In both cases, it's the set of all possible outputs of the function. All right, well, let's do an example of actually computing the range and null space of a matrix. So here's just some matrix, three, one, minus four, six, two, minus eight. We're gonna compute the range and null space of this matrix. All right, so let's start off with the range, okay? To compute the range of a matrix, we wanna find all vectors B such that this linear system has a solution, AX equals B, right? Because we wanna find all possible things in the output space. We wanna find all possible values of a times x. All right, so we wanna find all right-hand sides b such that this linear system has a solution, in other words. Okay, we don't care what that solution is, we just wanna know if there is a solution, okay? We wanna know, is b in the possible outputs? Is b in the output space? Is b in the range? All right, so the way that we solve this is we just do our usual linear system stuff, right? ax equals b, we write it in augmented matrix form. Okay, so here's a on the left, here's b on the right, and we wanna find which values of b1 and b2 lead to this linear system having a solution. All right, so just row reduce, get in row echelon form so that you can answer that question. So I'm gonna do row two minus three row one to get zeros on the bottom here. And now this is already in row echelon form, so I look at that and I say, okay, well, it's got a solution, if and only if this jump down here equals zero, right? 
remember like our test for a linear system having no solution, that was zero row, non-zero right-hand side. <clears throat> so the only way this has a solution is if this junk over here equals zero. B2 minus 2B1 has to equal zero. Okay, so our conclusion is that the range of this matrix, the set of Bs that lead to this linear system having a solution, is it's, well, it's all vectors B in R2, it's all two-dimensional vectors, such that this quantity equals zero, such that B2 equals 2B1. Okay, and we can write that set in a couple of different ways in case, I don't know, maybe you don't like writing it in this way. Maybe you write, like, sort of explicitly listing out what vectors are in that set. Well, if B2 equals 2B1, that's the same as saying, okay, the range is the set of all vectors of this form, B1, comma, 2B1, right? The second entry, B2, is 2B1, okay? Where B1 is just an arbitrary real number. Okay, or you could even factor that b1 out of this vector here, and you could say, hey, the range, it's the set of all multiples of the vector, 1, 2, right? We just factored b1 out in front here. Okay, and this makes it maybe a little bit more clear why, yeah, this actually is the subspace, like we proved it in general, but now you can actually see it as well, right? The range of this matrix, it's just the set of multiples of this particular vector. Okay, so it's just a line through the origin, which we already talked about. Yeah, lines through the origin, those are subspaces. All right, well... Great, that's range. Let's do the null space, okay? So to find the null space of this matrix, again, we're just solving a linear system. This one's a little bit more direct though, okay? To, to find the null space, we're just trying to find all vectors x such that ax equals zero. And this just this is a linear system. This is something that we learned how to solve in week five. So let's just solve it, okay? So it's kind of the same as what we did up here, except now it's gonna be zeros augmented on the right-hand side because the zero vector's on the right-hand side. All right, so there's a, augmented with zeros, and again, you just row reduce down to row echelon form, okay? So what we get is this, which is the exact same as the row echelon form we had up above, but zeros on the right-hand side instead of junk involving Bs this time. All right, and now we'd like to describe the solution set of this linear system. Well, for this linear system, we're gonna have infinitely many solutions, right? Because we've only got one leading entry, but we've got three variables, okay? So remember, each of these columns corresponds to a variable, x1, x2, and x3 in this case, the entries of the solution vector x, okay? And we've got a leading entry here, so x1 is leading and all other variables are free. So x2 and x3, they're free, they can be anything at all, okay? But then x1 is something in terms of x2 and x3, okay? And if you just rearrange this top equation and solve for that leading variable x in terms of the other variables, what you get is the null space, well, it's all vectors in three-dimensional space such that such that we'll just rearrange this equation. This means 3x1 plus x2 minus 4x3 equals zero. Rearrange that and solve for x1. x1 equals this junk over here, where x2 and x3 can be anything. Okay. And again, you can rewrite that set in a couple of different ways. Okay. Another way of writing it down would be you could explicitly list what are the vectors in that set. Well, x1 has to be equal this junk, so that's the first entry of the vector. x1 equals minus a third x2 plus four thirds x3. And then x2 and x3 just are what they are. x2 and x3 can be anything at all, okay? So this null space, because there are two free variables here, there's sort of two directions that you can move in this subspace. It's a plane, okay? It lives in three-dimensional space, but it's just a two-dimensional subspace of it, okay? So it's a plane, okay? The null space of this matrix is a plane in three-dimensional space. Alrighty, so that'll do it for today's lecture. I will see you next time when we start talking about the span of set of vectors, which is just sort of a new way of constructing subspaces. Alright, so I'll see you then.